Hey, this is Rod Cleef, and you are listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. All right, welcome to the Mailbox Money Show. My name is Bronson Hill. Really excited that you're here today, either watching us on our YouTube channel or listening uh, on a podcast source. Uh, really excited to go over this topic, uh, both about short-term and long-term rental funds. I have my friend, Pascal Corgus is here today to go over just a lot of things. He started when he was 14 years old, has a very amazing story, and now he's involved in a lot of different aspects from owning uh, an insurance company, a CPA firm, he's a, a financial consultant, a mortgage company. He does construction. They do all kinds of different things. In his own words, we do everything. So I'd love to get into his story. He's also a power lifter, competitive power lifter. Um, so he inspires me. I need to gain about 80 pounds of muscle and then I could maybe compete with him or something. But uh, Pascal, how are you today? Really good to have you, man. Thank you, Boston. Thanks, God. I'm doing great. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, I've really enjoyed getting to know you. We hang out uh, at the real estate guys, some of their events. I love their events and just their culture because they're very abundant minded. And I've always experienced that from you as well. And just would love to uh, just have you maybe talk about, you know, a little bit of your story, how you got started in real estate. And then, uh, you know, I know you got, you got a lot you can share. We'll take them kind of one at a time, but kind of some of the, just to the high level, some of the different things that you do and uh, how you work with investors. Great, great. Um, I kind of have the, you know, immigrant coming to America story. We moved to New Jersey when I was three years old. We grew up in this uh, low income neighborhood and we didn't have a lot of uh, resources. So if I wanted something when I was young, I had to get it myself. So I started th the hard way, working, doing little odd ends jobs. And I started working at a barber shop down the street from where I lived when I was eight. I would sweep hair, get him lunch, clean his car, and I would make $10 a week. And eventually I worked up to about $20 a week. But if I wanted a video game, it would take me six weeks to get one video game, wow. one you know, Super Nintendo game. So fast forward, I learned how to trade comic books and baseball cards and such. Mm. Fast forward now to me being in high school or middle school, I was trading Pokemon cards. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get a better card. And, and between me and my little brother, we had eight edition one Charizards, which are $20,000 a piece today. Wow. So, but um, my mother gave them all away. Of course. <laughs> so have you, have you forgiven your mother? That's the question there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She sacrificed a lot for, for us. And she was back overseas. She was a, a midwife. So she made mm -hmm. really good money and gave all that up to come to America to basically work on the bottom so we have an opportunity so i do feel that i owe her something and part yeah. of my sense is to uh feeling like i owe her for the sacrifice that she made and my father made to bring us to a country where you can have the american dream so i really believe i'm living the american dream it's alive and well for those that want to work for it yeah so fast forward now having pokemon cards you have to trade up to get a better car <laughs> it's like that show where you start with a paper clip and you keep trading and end up with like an rv or a house or something that that's like a thing or people actually can trade and so you yeah. did that so you traded up traded up you just found i guess you kind of did you continually find suckers to trade with you or you just kind of put things together and made deals happen and it's it's not so much suckers because i don't believe <laughs> i have like like you mentioned abundant mindset where right. everyone has a need and yeah have you can like so for example everyone's like oh i got all this bitcoin right the bitcoin people i said okay you have all the bitcoin in the world and you have a huge stash and you have tons of bitcoin and it's worth a lot of money you're still gonna have to trade me your bitcoin to live on my property yeah you can't eat bitcoin yeah you can't drink it so you still don't have to trade it so me invest my my logic is do i have some cryptocurrency yes but my logic is if you have the assets that people are desiring, especially if you have assets that people that have money desire, they'll pay more over time. So as inflation increases, your asset and your rent will increase over time. So that's yeah. my, I'm very conscious about where I'm buying to see is my, does my tenant have the, a high probability of increasing the rent on them and then paying that increased rent. 
Yeah. And then you're, you're, you know, you do a lot in Florida because you live in Florida and we do a ton in Florida as well. And it's really for that reason that the population is growing. There's lots of great job prospects. It's business friendly. It's landlord friendly. And we're looking, you know, I live in LA and we've had a net loss over the last two years in population, even including the birth rate of, you know, lots of babies have been born, but in Florida, it's, it's grown about 2% over a two year period. So it's being in a place where if just demand is rising, it does, it's, it's less important how, a specific deal and performs. It's important, but it's less important because you're in the right market. If you're buying in the right markets, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tailwind where you're working there, which I love that you're doing that. So, I mean, I guess congrats on being in the right place and I guess you know, <laughs> living in the right place that so you chose well. <laughs> so, so you bring up a good point. It's, I call it the wind is to your back. If you're investing in an area where it has a net loss or in a neighborhood that is, you know, lower income, the wind isn't in your back. You, you have, less factors that are favorable that are, that are going to help you. And I realized that when I was, so by the age of 23, I'm going to fast forward the stories. I, I realized, okay, I kept on trading. Then at 14, I, le I learned that you can own real estate. The government gives you most of the money, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the tenant pays all your bills. You can keep the difference in the rent and you can keep the appreciation of the property. That was mind blowing that I didn't have yeah. to give anything to collect and I was yeah. starting to learn from, from 14 to, uh, to 16, I learned enough to be able to buy my first house, but my father wouldn't co-sign. Yeah. And I didn't have the tax returns to justify the loan, even though it made, not, made sense financially to do that deal. So at 19, I was able to get my two years of tax returns. Ah. And in the time period, I learned construction. I learned uh, property management. I learned credit, tax returns, mortgages. And I learned all these little things that eventually I opened up all these companies that that do those those different um, segments of the real estate business, you know, insurance, taxes, mortgages, property management. Now we have architectural engineering, we have construction as well. So we once I mastered something, I built a team to be able to uh, make our investments as profitable as possible. And most of the time that comes from how fast you can turn your deal. Right. Hey, let me slow you down one sec, Pascal. Um, you mentioned something that's really interesting. You started at 16 and, or 14, and then you just studied and learned. Obviously, your parents wouldn't co-sign. So you found a way. You just continue to learn this. Uh, I think a lot of us, myself included, I wish I had gotten these lessons about investing or real estate. I bought my first house. I think I was 26, but I didn't really start doing real estate and raising money and doing big deals until I was 37 or 38. It was, it was much later. Uh, do you, is your family, it sounds like your dad would not co-sign with you on the loan. So is your family kind of like a work, a work, a safe, secure job kind of family? And are you the only entrepreneur in your family? Cause this mindset you're talking about is a totally different mindset than like my family's all in education and they all thought it was crazy. Like, why would you leave your 200 K your job to go do something uncertain? Did you have some of that when you were getting going with this? I did in the sense my mom, my mother was a midwife. So overseas, she was making seven times the average income. So she wow. was very well paid for a third world country. A woman to be that educated wasn't normal. So she was a very modern woman and she believed in education. She believed in getting a medical degree. So she wanted me to become a dentist. And I tried. I really tried. I you got a good smile, man. She, she, made, you got a good. I don't know if you ever had braces, but you got a great this smile. This is genetics, actually. No, <laughs> <laughs> you can be a I dentist. Got some, I got some good genetics, but um, I tried for her. I tried it because you know I, I feel like I, you know, when your parents sacrifice so much for you, you feel yeah. like you need to give back. Um, now what they gave me in sacrifice, they were trying to put me in this box. But what I was able to get out of the box was to realize they're putting me in this box because they think this is the best. Once I kind of reviewed and analyzed how the system works here, I realized what they're what they want for me and the way they're trying to have me get to there isn't going to lead to the same result. Right. So a lot of people that are that make a lot of money will tell me their strategy is to buy a bunch of two hundred dollar two hundred thousand dollar homes, rent them out, and that's going to lead them to financial freedom. And that's what I, I thought. That's that's why mine were fifty thousand dollars houses. That's what I thought. And then I had like five of them, and I was like, "This is a ton of work," and it doesn't work. Like it does not work. It takes and I, too long, I, and you'll be thirty years from now, and maybe you're like, "It's it's, it's not it doesn't work." So I, I I explain that on paper or on my whiteboard and yeah. show them that look. 
you're going to be 75 and you're still not going to hit your goal. It's not going to work what you're, what you're trying to do. Can, so, so in, in Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, it says you, you basically become financially free when you can replace your W-2 through passive income. And from 19 to 23, I purchased 23 units. At that point, I was making wow. enough in passive income and I was using basically the Burr strategy. Back then, there was yeah. no name for it. I was just doing it because I learned that this pattern uh, resulted or gave you the best results. So uh, pattern recognition, I'm, I'm pretty, I've taken a lot of tests uh, and the pattern recognition, I'm pretty high in the top 99%. So that's my skill. Like I can recognize patterns yeah. and I realized, okay, this is the pattern. And I was able to roll thirty thousand dollars into three million dollars worth of real estate from nineteen to wow. twenty years old to twenty three years old. Did you see somebody else do that, or you just recognized the pattern? You had one, and then you kind of saw if I do this, then I can kind of like. How did you? You just, did you were you around other people that kind of taught you that, or you just kind of figured it out on your own since you're good at that? So what I did is I I did put myself around other people. It is a hundred percent coaching and being around the right people. So going to these events, why are we going to these events? Is so we can hone our skills and maybe come away with a little nugget that makes us 1% better. And if you keep doing that 1% better, it's a significant difference over time. So I was watching people do flipping and I saw the flippers and I saw how much money they made. And I was like, that's nice, but you had a huge tax liability and you had no actual wealth creation. You were just making money. You just, they just gave yourself a higher paid job. Yeah, right. Cool job with lots yeah. of risk. Then I saw people doing the buy and hold, and that wasn't making that much money. I mean, it's fine, but it's, it's going to take forever. And so I, I looked at all these different strategies that uh, people were using to uh, either pr produce higher cash flow or build wealth. And that's when I came to this model where I was going to do what today is called BRRRR. I buy in a really nice area, I add value to it. I don't sell it to someone else, but I flip it to myself. So I flip the hold to myself and then I pull out my initial equity and then I do it again. So I kept rolling that $30,000 into all the 23 units. And at that point I became financially free. I made as much money from my rentals from passive income than I did from the job I had at the bank. Uh, and that was nice, but again, it still wasn't that much money. So I just kept kept doing it yeah, yeah. businesses and opening and plus it's really fun once you get yeah, yeah, yeah. into it it gets addicting so yeah and once once you get going yeah it's amazing a lot of people that you know i talk to or you know i've had 1500 one-on-one -on -one phone calls with high net worth individuals and it's like a lot of them have an investor or they're just getting started and once you see the money come in and once you see it actually start to work you're like this is amazing i should be doing more of this and then it's like rinse and repeat and it's different than a job where it's like okay if you're an engineer Maybe you cap out at 200,000 or 250, whatever it is. There's no limit to how much you can make with this. And it's not just, you know, okay, how much can I make? But it's, you know, also the impact you can make with that. I want to shift for a minute. I want you to go back to it. I think this is a really interesting conversation because a lot of people I talk to are active and they have some houses or they're doing some projects or construction, different things. And other ones are like, no, I'm, I'm just a doctor and I'm fully passive and they only do that. It seems like you, uh, it just from the outside, it looks at you, you never met a deal you didn't like. You found a way to make it work and you've got all these businesses and all these things. I'm sure there's deals that don't work for you, but talk to us about like, what was the reason you've added, you know, a CPA or tax? For, I mean, you literally have these companies that you run or you own. You have your insurance broker. I think you were telling me about that. You have a mortgage company of all this stuff that you're doing. Has that led to a lot of synergies for you from one thing to the other? Or has it been kind of hard and felt like it spread you a little thin at times? Does it spread you thin at times? Yes. Uh, yes. It, it, <laughs> um, it, you understand you're running a, a business, you're running multiple businesses because there's so many different aspects. Right. So it does it spread thin, balancing that with your personal life, balance that with family. It does. And, uh, and I'm all about balance right now. And I'm doing that by partnering. So it can spread you thin if you don't pro partner properly. If you don't find, if you're trying to do everything yourself, it will become, it will overcome you and you'll just yeah. be working all day long. So now that we've partnered properly, we're bringing, meeting, getting together with the right people and, and sharing responsibilities and everybody doing what they're the best at. And we're working together as a team. 
You know, you can't win the Super Bowl by yourself. You yeah. need a solid team. And there's different levels of the owner, the coaches, the players, and then everybody else helping making the facility work. So there's, I just look at it as a team where like we were talking about investing. Now, I think, and you know, you do a lot of uh, investments yourself. I'm one of the only GPs that doesn't uh, remove the LPs from my deal. Meaning during a cash out refi, our goal is to give everybody their money back create the birth strategy for LPs. And once they get their money back, we don't actually remove anybody from our, from our investment. Yeah. They stay with us yeah. as long as we keep it. So yeah. when we just basically keep rolling that initial $5 million into the next deal and the next deal. Right. So it's, it's about team. It's, yeah. And that way you, you don't have to really look for that many new investors. If you're, yeah doing the cash out refi and paying them back and they get to stay, they're usually repeat investors, repeat partners. So it makes things easier when you're not hunting for another deal. When yeah. you're really just focusing on how can I maximize the deals that I have? How can I maximize the, the people that I have on my team? So instead of me looking for new staff, every staff member gets a cut of the deals we invest in. They don't have to have a hundred thousand dollar minimum. We'll give our and our uh, staff members five thousand dollar bonuses every year, and they can put it into our deals. Nice. So the guy who does maintenance owns the building. The That's person great. who does insurance owns the building. The bookkeeper owns the building. The CPA yeah. owns the building. So well, everybody's everyone, invested in everybody's invested in what's happening too. So I think that's a really great way to go about it. And we do the same on our deals. We don't. We don't buy investors unless we sell a property. We don't, you know, cash. And there are people that do that. They can actually cash people out and they're out. Um, I've seen it in different types of deals, not in multifamily. I wanted to ask you, Pascal, we have a few more minutes. I wanted to talk about, um, you do, you talked about you're doing construction. You have a ground up construction company. You have a fund where you guys do long and short term rentals. And it's kind of a diversified between those two. Can you talk about the advantages of having both of those as opposed to one? We do a lot of kind of longer term apartment, you know, bigger apartment deals. There's people that do short-term rental funds or things like that, but to have them both together, are there some advantages of that? I want you to talk about that. So if you can, the, the benefits and the, the pros and cons are pretty clear. And in a, in a long-term fund, the pro is consistent income. The con is the income doesn't grow that aggressively. For short-term rentals, the pro is you can have significant increase in your income. The con is if you have a season, a slow season, you can actually go negative. And people don't talk about that. Everyone right. online right now is talking about how amazing the short-term rentals are. Um, I was speaking at an event in Vegas and I showed, I showed them we made $160,000 in one month in short-term rental revenue. Uh, and everyone's like, whoa, that's amazing. I said, you need to know <laughs> that when people show you that, yeah. they also need to show you how much their expenses are. And not everyone's, everyone that's selling a course isn't being transparent. It's not always a smart idea. What's, what's good about us having the in-house property management is that we'll review the numbers and we'll, we'll see what, what is the return for having it as a short-term rental. If it isn't high enough, we'll flip it back to a long-term rental. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, we'll smart. See it, and we'll buy multiple, what we do is we end up buying multiple, you know, duplexes to eight plexes to 16 plexes in a city. So we have a distributed apartment complex model. From there, we'll see which of the properties is performing the best as a short-term rental. Yeah. So we'll increase those units. If we see that uh, another street isn't doing as well, we'll reduce those units and we'll convert them back to long-term. Right. So we'll measure unit by unit, what is the performance? So you, so you get, it gives you flexibility to kind of move back and forth. Now, do you, so you'll do it. And I would say you do in-house property management. So are your property, like your team, are they kind of versed in doing both? Like they're pretty familiar. Okay. If this needs, cause that's a whole different structure, right? If you're doing long-term rentals, you pretty much got to make sure the place is painted. It's clean. Everything's kind of working. And then you get somebody in there. Short-term rentals, like you got to have a maid come every night. You got to check for maintenance. You got to like, it's a whole nother level. So is that like kind of two different teams or are there aspects of like, if it's a short-term rental, they get all this extra stuff or how do you coordinate all that between the, because we've thought about this at some of our apartment buildings where we've got 
a hundred units or whatever. We'll take 10 of them or take a couple of buildings and make it, but it's been hard with the property management because they're not, that's not their thing. And so dividing that up, you're able to do it because you do it in-house. But can you talk about that a little bit? So we'll have uh, myself and the lead property manager um, review the numbers. And we'll see, we'll start looking out and projecting out. We'll also talk to other people in the industry because we have relationships with other people in the area to see what's the market doing. And then based off of that information, we will we will run the, the projections and determine, okay, these units need to be switched. So then we'll let the people underneath the property manager know these units are going to be switched from short-term to long-term. We'll move that furniture into another property that should be short-term and at that point um, can switch the units from long to short or short to long based off of our projections. I see. Okay. Um, that's really interesting. Now, let's talk for a minute about construction right now. We're recording this uh, you know, mid-April 23, and it, you know, it, it's lending has changed. Uh, financing for construction has changed. Has it gotten... Um, like what sort of, when you're doing these projects and cause some of these are new builds for you, right? And then are you buying some existing stuff or is it all pretty much new builds that you're doing? It's a split. It depends on where we are. So yeah. uh, we'll buy, right, for example, we bought a bunch of fourplexes for about $800,000, but they need about $400,000 in reno. So we'll be in for about 1.2 million in the fourplex, but the single family home next door is going to be built for 1.5 million, brand new. So we're at 1.2, it's 1.5 for a single family and we're grandfathered in on our fourplex or fiveplex. Right. Five so we, we, we target very specific things like that. Now the brand new ground up is, is really great as well because we are, the, the city has changed zoning for certain uh, single family home to medium density. So now the single family home is, is able to be a fourplex or an eightplex. So we're buying those, we're knocking those down and building brand new fourplexes ground up. Yeah. We're, we're our cost, our cost is roughly again, this is today, right? Tomorrow is different. In one hour it could be different. But as of today, a full gut reno, and what I mean by a full gut reno means we, we'll take a building, we'll knock it down all the way to the block. So we got everything out of it. All the drywall, all the electric, all the plumbing, the sewer lines, AC, everything is gone. Yeah. We put brand new electric plumbing, AC and sewer. We spray from the, the property, all new uh, pressure treated wood to reduce the probability of termites and mold to grow on it. We do uh, mold resistant drywall. We put hurricane windows, hurricane doors. If you don't know, insurance in Florida is very expensive right now. It's gone crazy. So we're able to say uh, our competition is paying $6,000 for insurance. We'll, we'll be paying $2,400. Because of all of the hurricane straps we put in, yep, the hurricane updates, the board, yeah, yeah. all the updates we're doing. So it's it you can save money on your expenses and your maintenance by doing a property proper remodel up front. So yeah. that full gut reno costs about a hundred dollars a square foot. Two thousand square feet costs two hundred thousand. Four thousand square feet, four hundred thousand. Um, so that's it's still ex more expensive than it was. But because of how aggressive the rent's going up, it's actually financially still makes sense because the rents are going up aggressively. A brand new um, property in downtown St. Pete, they charge $3,000 for a one bedroom wow. where, where we can come in and make good money at $1,800 to $2,000. So you have, a, yeah, you have a competitive advantage. It's interesting. It's kind of the, uh, the John Rockefeller model, right? Where you just, if you can do the whole process you can cut out a lot of different steps. So, you know, he was with Standard Oil and he was able to go from, you know, getting the oil, doing the refining, the whole process of that, even the shipping and everything, he was able to just undercut anybody. And I mean, that's why they started some of these monopoly laws because he was able to do it so effectively. But if you have in-house, you're able to do these different things with construction and with your property management, you're able to create efficiencies on all of that and able to, to really be able to win. Well, that's that's really great. Well, uh, one more question. Uh, what What is... Um, what is one thing that you're really excited about right now in the market that you're seeing? There's a lot of people that are very concerned and skeptical and just, you know, I found just in general, it's investor sentiment has kind of, you know, people are kind of shy to gun shy to get involved because of interest rates and everything. But what's something that you were excited about or how do you look at all this? So what I'm excited about is that so many people left. 
I've been doing this for 20 something years now, right? I'm 37 and I've been learning since I was 14, my own money since I was 19. And it's just, it got so crowded, so crowded. You couldn't make money. It was so hard to make money. Now, we're, we're, okay, this is, uh, this is today, tomorrow's different. But as of today, you could buy land, go ground up and be at 60% of um, resale value. So our all-in cost is 60% of re re uh, resale value. Wow. So, you know, right now, because there's very few players involved, you can get that. Now, tomorrow, next week, next month, say everyone is tired of being on the sidelines and they want to get back in, they're going to come in, they're going to they're gonna flood the market again and we'll be back to 80% cost. So brand new ground up, you'll be at 80% of cost of retail. So this doesn't leave you much margin. So when you're when you have that much margin, that much room for error, it's it's exciting for me because now we can do ground up for the cost of a remodel. Yeah, no, it's it's huge. It's you know, Warren Buffett talks about the term margin of safety. That when you go into a deal, you just the bigger that margin, things can go not well. And I think as an investor, whether you're a passive investor, or you're an active investor, I always ask this question, you know, how could I lose money in this deal? And there's always risk to every deal. So the bigger that margin you have, uh, you know, the better that is, uh, you know, for, for, for yourself and for investors. Well, Abasco, this has been awesome, man. I just want to say, I really appreciate your abundant mindset, your ability to really connect with individuals. And, and, you know, I know you have a huge social media following. And so we're going to have you in a minute, have people, you know, have, ask how people can connect with you, but also the way you have, uh, the ability you're doing everything in the process. You're able to control from the hey, we get the land, we get this, we build it, we we have the in-house property management. It's 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 really great to see. And you've just created all these different supportive businesses, such as an insurance brokerage, uh, a tax firm, mortgage. You can basically like we 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 do it all, right? We can do it all. And you found a way. I think well, there's that book called Who Not How of just finding good partners, so that it's just that you know you have more businesses but you're not working a hundred hours or you're finding a way to just have other people do different things. So really appreciate that about you and all the value you're adding to the marketplace. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, if they're looking to kind of, uh, to contact me, you can go info at K O R C F.com. K O R C F.com info at, um, and then I'm on all of the social media sites, IG, YouTube, TikTok, which is at Pascal Corpus, my name. And I encourage you to check him out on social media too. He's got like a billion followers and he's doing really fun videos about all kinds of stuff. So, uh, Pascal, really great to see you, man. I'm looking forward to hanging out. Uh, I think in Belize, I'll see you again here in a couple months, which is going to be a blast. So we're going to have a good time there and uh, put our feet in the sand. It'll be good, but uh, awesome. Thanks for coming in today and, and having this uh, chat and look forward to seeing you again soon. It'll be fun. I'll see you then. All right, so Bascal has got a lot to share about a lot of things. Super knowledgeable, you know, obviously from age, you know, 14, 15, 16, pattern recognition. I don't know if you're like me. I wish I could go back and have learned some of the stuff or had an interest in it. Maybe you have kids and they're 14, 15, 16, and you just wish you could instill this in them. Well, uh, this is somebody who is really good at pattern, pattern recognition. And I like, you know, like I mentioned, he can control that whole process to come in and be able to do it. There's a disadvantage of that, obviously, because uh, you are spread thin, but if you have good team members, you're able to do it and actually create synergies because you have your, your mortgage stuff, leads to the insurance thing, leads to the tax thing, leads to doing deals, leads to now you give people good experience. So if you can do it right, uh, there's not many people who can do it well. It seems like Basquiat is really doing it, uh, doing it right, which is awesome. He also wanted, he also mentioned this after we stopped recording that there's this idea of the macro where uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, where he's working, um, he saw some things happening there where there was some large, like during COVID, there were some large employers and especially Wall Street groups that were moving to St. Pete's and there were, you know, 500 jobs or a thousand jobs, whatever. And he realized that a lot of people were making really good money. And so he mentioned this on the show that, uh, you know, by charging $3,000 a month for a new one bedroom, um, you know, they were still profitable if they were uh, you know, able to charge 1800. So again, just finding those things where you get this big margin, you can come in and be able to do it. And again, we'll sometimes ask, we'll still tell the question, like I, I you know, we'll say, I can't do this, but the better question is how can I do this? And a lot of times it involves partners, it involves learning how to do it, going to networking events and finding a way to do it. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
please do rate, write a comment, review, share it with a friend. Um, you know, again, follow Pascal's stuff online. I know he's got a fund as well, but uh, really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, and I say thank you for edu taking the time to educate yourself because it is, it's, it's an honor to be able to do this with you. And it's something I'm committed to my own financial education. And I love that you are too. So look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Mailbox Money. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune next time for more Mailbox Money.